I am Dale Bredesen, a neurologist and neuroscientist, and I want to thank everyone for their interest in 21st century medicine and dentistry. I want to show a few slides here if I can uh, pull this up here and share my screen. All right. So what I want to show you today is that this is a new era. Um, the way we practice medicine and dentistry is changing radically in the 21st century, and it's having a huge impact, um, including better results than have ever been achieved before in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. And we've gotten to the point where we can say now that Alzheimer's is uh, optional. Uh, nobody who gets on active prevention or earliest reversal really needs to get this disease. And that is a fundamental change from everything that went before. We've published hundreds of cases now of documented improvement. We've also published a clinical trial. It's freely available online, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in 2022. We are now uh, doing a second larger randomized controlled trial, which is ongoing at six different sites. Uh, Miami and Nashville, Cleveland, uh, San Francisco, uh, East Bay, and Sacramento. So there's a lot going on uh, and, uh, again, achieving better results than ever before. And it turns out that a critical part, the reason that people get Alzheimer's, has to do with the oral microbiome, the toxicants that come, such as mercury uh, from the mouth, the airway that is critical, all the things that are part of dental practice. So that is going to be a huge part going forward of getting best outcomes in people with cognitive decline. So this is a very exciting time. I've spent my whole career, uh, I had a lab for 30 years that studied this uh, phenomenon of neurodegeneration. So what does this mean for oral systemic care, reducing the global burden of dementia. Uh, and again, dentists are going to play a huge role in this because of the fact that they are the ones who are getting the best outcomes with various pathology uh, in the mouth. Uh, increasing practice size and efficacy. Um, there is uh, so much more that can be done. Uh, being part of a team that, dresses, that addresses the root causes of chronic illness, potentially saving someone from your own family or circle. About 15% of people uh, die of Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is, uh, we're talking about 45 million Americans. Let me turn that up a little bit there. Uh, about 45 million of the currently living Americans, unfortunately, uh, will die from Alzheimer's disease if we don't initiate, if we don't propagate um, this approach to prevention and reversal of cognitive decline. And then, as I said earlier, just this is the movement of 21st century medicine and dentistry to understand the drivers of the process, be they the oral microbiome, be they the the uh, things that toxins like mercury, um, airway, changes of sleep apnea, changes in uh, oxygenation, oxygen saturation during the night, all of these things, absolutely crucial, as I'll show you for Alzheimer's disease. I think it's important to point out when we hear on the television or the radio or online um, that there is success in Alzheimer's, what they mean in the drug world is this, that instead of decreasing here, three and a half points on average on a 30 point scale per year, you're decreasing slightly less. In the case of lecanemab, which was approved recently as lecembi, um, it's 27% slower. They're not making people better. Whereas what I'll show you today actually makes people better. And actually I've just finished a paper that's submit, gonna be submitted this week that it shows over 10 years uh, of sustained improvement in these people. So it's not just making people better, it's sustaining their improvement for many years, which of course is the goal for best outcomes in Alzheimer's disease. And, and I think as many people are already aware, what's happened is the way classical medicine was set up was for a hundred years ago for simple, acute illnesses, pneumococcal pneumonia, more chronic illnesses like tuberculosis, and even HIV, where you could go after these optimally with single or a couple of drugs the way with HIV, obviously with triple therapy. Um, but what's happened is the Titanic of mainstream medicine has rammed into uh, the iceberg of chronic illness. Um, and is going down. Unfortunately, we don't have good treatments, whether you're talking about Alzheimer's disease, whether you're talking about Lewy body disease, 
ALS, frontotemporal dementia, chronic renal failure, uh, any of these complex chronic illnesses, even cancer, where there has been some success, especially with things like immunotherapy, now, this is still a major killer um, in most of the world. Uh, things, even cardiovascular disease. So these are complex chronic illnesses. They are fundamentally different than the illnesses for which our healthcare system is set up. So we have to change the way we think about them, change the way we understand them, and change the way we attack them and prevent them. So at least here in the U.S., it's a truly sad state of affairs when it comes to Alzheimer's. And here's why. The physicians encourage the patients to wait. They say, if you've come in and you've got some problems with your memory, yeah, it's probably not Alzheimer's. They only treat it in the relatively late stages. They use small data sets with no attempt to identify the underlying drivers, such as mycotoxins, for example. Adherence to this outdated claim that there's nothing that will prevent, reverse, or delay Alzheimer's. Uh, and then the nursing home patients, if someone comes into a nursing home in late stages, nobody in the nursing home says, well, wait a minute, let's get everybody from the next generation of the family to get on active prevention, which is what should happen so that we can truly make this a, a, an optional disease. In the United States, patients spend unbelievably an average of $350,000. This is the life savings of most people. Uh, before dying of Alzheimer's because of nursing home expenses, which are huge, um, drug uh, treatment, caretakers at home, all these things. And it unfortunately leaves many people destitute. And this should not happen. We can avoid this now. And then this, and finally, this insistence on treatment with single pharmaceuticals, which lack efficacy, ignoring what we've already published that shows that we can do far better than what's happening with these. So let me show you under the hood why we do what we do. If you look at the crux, if you look at the central feature in Alzheimer's, it is the driving of amyloid precursor protein. This is a protein that sticks through the membrane. So here's the membrane of a single neuron. Um, and this is especially true at the synapse area. Here's the amino terminus of the protein. Here's the carboxy terminus. As you can see, most of this protein is outside the cell, a little bit's inside the cell. Now, what's interesting is this actually acts like a switch. When things are good, when you have enough support, when you don't have too much inflammation, you have enough hormonal support, enough growth factor support, enough nutritional support, APP re literally recognizes that and is cleaved. And you can follow the molecules literally if you give, for example, estradiol that influences hundreds of genes, of course. And one of them is the one that cuts APP at the alpha site. So you get these two peptides that actually support growth and maintenance of synapses. And on the other hand, when things are bad, too little support, too little oxygenation, too much mercury, change in oral microbiome, all these things, APP is now cut at three sites. And again, you can follow the molecular pathways. The activation of NF-kappa B is one of the common ways that activates the cleavage here and here. So you can see here's the amyloid beta that the drug companies have tried to remove as a way to treat this illness. Yes, it's a, it's a part of the overall program, but it's not nearly the total disease. So they're really doing the wrong things uh, in many ways. There's much more to this disease than just amyloid. So what this does is these change your brain into a protective downsizing mode. So you're now just like the country did uh, when we had the pandemic, everyone told us shelter in place, socially distanced, don't go into work. And of course, there was a there was a recession, no surprise. This is the same thing that's happening in the brain. When there are problems, you have inflammation, you have toxin exposure, you have reduction in growth factors, reduction in hormones, for example, with menopause, poor nutritional support with low vitamin D, low vitamin B12, things like that. All of these things drive you in this direction and now are protectively downsizing. The amyloid is actually quite a good antimicrobial. Uh, and so you are making an antimicrobial and basically saying, I will live with a slightly smaller brain so that I can fight these various uh, insults. 
So what, when we treat patients, what we do is look at what's driving this in that direction. Everybody with cognitive decline is on the wrong side of this balance. So we then want to drive you back toward the positive side. We literally want to increase the supply and decrease the demand by improving things uh, like toxin exposure and like inflammation. So what that means is the perfect Alzheimer's drug, if you want to develop an Alzheimer's drug, and we did this in the lab for years um, and actually had a, had a drug trial, but, but the problem is this, there are too many targets for a single drug. So no matter what drug that you develop, it cannot hit all of these targets in Alzheimer's disease. That is the problem with this disease. So you really have to look for, for each patient, what's going on, what's driving the problem, and then address those things. And when we've done that, we've had better results than anyone else in the world. So we tell the patients, you have a roof with 36 holes because there are all these different things going on. And <clears throat> fixing one of them, a drug is a great patch for one hole but it doesn't do the rest. So you really need, again, to look at what's going on. So the role of dentists and oral systemic specialists is evaluate and optimize the oral microbiome. As you know, if you have P. gingivalis, T. denticola, F. nucleatum, P. intermedia, any of these things, then you are at increased risk. And obviously this group knows far more about this than I do. Address the potential toxicity for mercury. This is a common player. And in fact, if you just give an animal mercury, they develop what looks like Alzheimer's disease. It induces both plaques and tangles. So it gives you the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And then evaluate and treat sleep disorder breathing, such as obstructive sleep apnea or upper airway resistance syndrome, incredibly common. We see people all the time who have dropped their uh, SpO2. And in fact, just had someone recently who'd done well for six years, dramatically improved, and then she started having problems again. It turned out she had undiagnosed severe sleep apnea and addressing that has helped her to get better once again. And then in appropriate patients, cone beam identification of abscesses and appropriate treatment, addressing root canals. Uh, when do they need to be removed? When do they not need to be removed? And then identification of, her of herpes simplex virus type one, one of the most common contributors to cognitive decline, according to Professor, uh, Professor Ruth Itsaki's uh, research from the UK. All of these things are critical players in the cognitive decline that becomes Alzheimer's disease. So I just want to say a moment about the, the trial that we have published. And again, you can see all the details freely available online in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease from last year. I did this with Dr. Ann Hathaway, Dr. Kat Toops, and Dr. Deborah Gordon, three outstanding uh, uh, physicians, uh, functional medicine physicians. Um, so this was the first trial. Instead of predetermining a treatment, say we're going to give this drug or we're going to give that drug, we actually looked at all the different contributors and then addressed those. So this is a personalized approach. We got turned down by the Institutional Review Boards 2011-2018, uh, was approved in 2019. We completed it and it was finally posted and then published last year, as I mentioned. It's a small proof of concept trial with 25 patients. We're now doing a larger, as I mentioned, randomized controlled trial. So very excited about that. Uh, this compares personalized precision medicine protocol for nine months to historical outcomes. So there's a tremendous amount of data uh, already published on what happens to Alzheimer's patients. And so we are comparing our results to those. Uh, we look at the root cause contributors, pathogens, toxins, three different types of toxins, metals, organics, and biotoxins. The, the underlying genetics, so, you know, is the person APOE4 positive or negative? Do they have other genes such as TREM2 that may have contributed? Nutrients, trophic factors, hormones, immune responses, all of these. And every one of these patients saw a dentist for evaluation and treatment. So we look at things like MOCA score. We also look at CNS vital signs. So we do multiple tests for cognition. We also ask the partner, how are they doing? This, this gives us multiple looks. CNS vital signs is an online approach, a very sensitive approach. So that between the MOCA, which is a little less sensitive and the CNS vital signs, which is more sensitive, but it is at a very, very poor cognition. Um, it's not particularly good. So that gives us a larger dynamic range overall. 
We looked at MRI with volumetrics before and after treatment. Um, we looked at, for example, uh, the neurocognitive index, which is from CNS Vital Signs. And as you can see, unlike all of these trials where it's going down, but simply more slowly with the treatment, this actually improved. And as I say, has stayed improved. You can see we had a couple here. The pandemic started right here. So we had a, a few that actually went down, but overall people did better. And this was statistically significant. We also saw improvements in metabolism. So inflammation went down, hemoglobin A1C improved. And these were both statistically significant. Their insulin resistance improved, although that didn't reach statistical significance because we didn't have data on everyone for that one. Uh, their lipid panels improved, again, statistically significant. Their homocysteine, so their methylation improved, again, statistically significant. And their vitamin D levels improved, again, statistically significant. Interestingly, they improved on their MRI, so their gray matter volume actually improved. So we saw improvements, as I mentioned, in MOCA, 76% of the people improved with MOCA, 84% on their neurocognitive index, their cognitive subtests improved. So they improved with their verbal memory, with their executive function, their psychomotor speed, their cognitive flexibility, and others. Their AQ20s, and these are the, this is where the partners say, do they think they're better? Do they think they're worse? Again, statistically, significantly, they found improvement. Um, their brain training, which is called Brain HQ, 100% of these patients improved on their brain training. Their gray matter volume actually got larger. And even normal aging, it tends to go down slightly, a couple percent a year. These people had actually improved, even though they had mild cognitive impairment or dementia. So they were late stage in their presentations and their gray matter volume actually got better. Their hippocampal volume went down very slightly, but again, far less than someone with Alzheimer's and even less than normal aging. So overall, these people did extremely well. These are by far the best results that have ever been uh, that have ever been reported in people with Alzheimer's disease. I published three books on this, The End of Alzheimer's from 2017. And by the way, this is in uh, Spanish, Portuguese, 32 different languages, so readily available. Um, then End of Alzheimer's Program, which gives more basic details. And then most recently, The First Survivors, seven of the people who did very well actually wrote their own stories about what it felt like to be told there's nothing that can be done, and then finally to, to get better. So the bottom line here is, this is the beginning of a new era. It's an era of precision medicine. It's an era of more interaction between dentists and physicians. It's an era of understanding the root causes. And it's an era of treating complex chronic illnesses with a success rate that has never been seen before. Whether you're talking about lupus, or you're talking about Alzheimer's, or you're talking about ALS, or you're talking about chronic renal failure, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, 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 cardiovascular disease, on and on and on, there are better results being obtained than ever before. So uh, very uh, appreciative of the, uh, of the chance to talk with you here, and I look forward to further discussions. I will uh, end this here, and thanks, thanks very much again for having me. Please let us know if there are any, any questions. We look forward to working with you.